third year PhD student here at UT, and I'm presenting a paper titled Fela's Tragic Protagonist. And I think in some way, the presentations that we've heard today um, provide some context for, for the paper I'm presenting, um, at least to the extent that they, they paint the picture of a, of a socio-political milieu, um, which is Nigeria, um, within the terms of a post-colonial con um, condition. And um, this is not directly tied to the work of um, Dr. Jegede, but I believe that um, Fela Kuti and Dr. Jegede were working in the same, from a specific political context, um, which is Nigeria in the 70s and the 80s. And that, this is where I locate my work. And um, just to speak a little further, um, Dr. Jegede has also written specifically an article on Fela, on his early encounter with Fela Kuti. So I find that we might have, um, there might be a tangent to, to, um, to the papers you've experienced today. Um, for the most part, I'll be reading, um, so please bear with me. Um, this this um, work comes to me um, from years of trying to conceive of the complexity of um, Fela Kuti, who um, may be familiar to so many people in the room, but maybe not to others. Fela Kuti was um, a Nigerian musician um, activist who used his music to um, paint a picture of um, the crisis of, uh, of, of Nigeria's um, dwindling um, politics, polity, uh, and um, social conditions. Um, his music was anti-establishment, anti-neocolonialist, um, um, anti-imperialist. So to this extent, I'm trying to locate how, how do I apprehend um, this man in relation to social memory, and how do I conceive of him in relation to um, uh, our imagination um, of, of, of the kind of life he lived, and how do we talk about him? And this is where I, I, I locate, uh, I try to frame him as a tragic protagonist within a specific um, context, which is Nigeria in the 70s and 80s. Felakuti was, um, Felakuti's music was a commentary on the breakdown of the moral compass and social structures of the Nigerian post-colonial state. As many scholars have argued, Felakuti embodied the very idea of a post-colonial contradiction or the impossibility that can characterized the Nigeria of the 70s and the 80s. Through his music, Fela grappled with locating the African citizen within, within this realm of impossibility or this realm of contradiction. In hindsight, in hindsight like, however, we enjoy the privilege of embedding Fela himself in the very environment of impossibility within which he lived, walked, and from whose cosmology of signs he created art. In other words, retrospection favors our analyzing fella not as a character working not only as a character working within a specific social social political milieu but also as a product of that um, environment as witnesses to fella's life and to a certain degree as partakers in the world of science within which he worked we can examine his character across multiple trajectories so much so that fella's music production across time become critical coordination, coordinates for apprehending the man as a protagonist in a tragedy who is out to fulfill a vision or solve a puzzle. And here I'm using tragedy specifically as a dramatic genre. And I'm doing this to chart a framework across time. As in dramatic tragedies, the plays unfolding affords the reader the benefit of confronting the hero's hubris that is, the protagonist's flaw in character, which will eventually lead, lead to his fall. At the hands of a skilled playwright, readers of a tragedy are guided towards a state of empathy with the protagonist as he wades through time, space, and situation. Unfortunately, no one dramatic form or formula is adequate in capturing the complexities of Felakuti. Despite this reality, I have tried to reconcile the rigidity of this dramatic form with the dynamism of such a character as Fela Kuti. In casting Fela into a tragedy, or as one himself, I attempt to provoke a different or even uncomfortable imagination about his life and his works. <coughs> the benefit of tragedy in this application is that it affords, it affords the possibility of chatting <laughs> Seven minutes, 
Okay, um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, sorry, that's the benefit of tragedy in this application is that it affords the possibility of charting a counter narrative about Fela, the kind of which does not enthuse about the protagonist's triumph over evil or adversary. Besides, tragedy reminds us of two fundamental truths. The first being that the protagonist is also human, capable of feeling pain and susceptible to an environment. Two, that the concept of heroism is not irreconcilable with failure, retreat, or resignation. Doing this work is doubly difficult in the case of Felakuti, who through his life and his artistic choices carefully choreographed a heroic imagination of himself. Um, I try to, in grappling with this idea of being a tragic protagonist, I, um, one of the things that concern me is, is both Fela's choreography of himself and our reception of him um, as a historical character. And I point towards, I, I'm, I'm analyzing this in two ways. The first is through this Broadway musical, which was produced by <coughs> B.O.T. Jones, that um, focuses on Fela's life and work. But I find it problematic, the Broadway aesthetic of celebration and juxtaposing that against the, the framework or the background of um, the reality of Nigeria's condition. And to see how um, we keep on reviving Fela, that in, in, in trying to imagine, <coughs> it, I, 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 in looking at this, I'm saying that in reinscribing or reviving Fela in performances, both um, performances on, on, on low scale in Nigeria or on the scale of, of Broadway, that in doing this, we are bringing him back to fight a fight that he was never able to, to win, or a battle that he lost, so to say. And this is one strand that uh, I look at, but the other strand which I find more compelling for the sake of, of this presentation is to look at his actual works. And so I focus on one work, which is um, Confucian Break Bone which um, he released in 1992, and I'm using that to, to, chat, um, to, to, to chat a plot between Confucian Breakbone and Confusion, which was released in 1975. So Confucian Breakbone is a remix or a revisiting of, of Confusion, and I argue that these, these, these two albums, or these two songs in these albums, can give us a way of thinking about, about Fela's vulnerabilities, which in, in many cases, or in popular discourse, you would have, hardly have anybody talk about Fela in the sense of, of, of failure, in the sense of suffering, in the sense of pain, which I try to do in this, um, in this, um, in this paper. His 1992 release, Confusion Breakbone, marks a cornerstone in Fela's career in the same way that it offers critical insight into Fela's vulnerabilities. Confusion Breakbone was initially published in 1990 and later re released in 1992 in his 1992 Underground System album making it one of the first, one of the last songs in Fela's career as a public artist. For reason, reasons best known to him, and for which I offer a tentative hypothesis, Fela decide, decided to model Confusion Breakbone on the earlier song titled Confusion, which he had sung in 1975. Both songs, one a working on the other, rehashed the theme of chaos that characterized the landscape of Lagos State um, two decades apart, as well as the chaos enacted daily by the residents of Lagos State in pursuit of survival. Although both songs share commonalities in themes, in theme and lyrics, as one would expect an original and its remix, the overall spirit of both songs differ radically. First, they, they differ sonically, so that while confusion favors a more likely upbeat sound and snappy call and response singing that typifies Afrobeat, confusion breakbone is uncharacteristically slow-paced, features whole sequences of horn renditions delivered poco a poco, and reiterated throughout the roughly 30-minute song. In the moment when Fela performs his musical solo on the saxophone, it is soulful, ruminative, it is a soulful and ruminative interplay between him and the orchestra, who maintain the song's tempo and mood. Both songs differ stylistically. The entire opening section of confusion is marked by improvisational <coughs> exchanges 
between between Fela on the saxophone and Tony Allen on the drums. Fela and Allen's play and interplay gives confusion a qualitative distance from the cultural milieu within which they performed. The opening sequence of confusion sounds very much like electronic rock music, which is for people um, familiar with Afrobeat, it's totally, if you listen to Confusion, the first time I listened to it, I was like, is this Fela Kuti? So there is, there is an experimental feel to Confusion that we don't find in Confusion Breakbone. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So Confusion sounds very much like, much like okay, I can work with that. <laughs> so Confusion sounds very much like um, electronic music with sustained notes, rolling drums, echoing notes, contrapuntal dialogue between the drums and the horns, and of course, silence. This moment in the song whets the listener's appetite, the whets the <coughs> listener's anticipation, and marks the song's substance as a thing to come, a work gesturing towards a future landscape. For the ardent Afrobeat listener, the opening of confusion sounds, the, op the, op the opening of confusion sounds outlandish because of its futuristic quality that Fel Fela experiments with. Confusion does not become Afrobeat until the freestyle interplay between drums and horns build up to a crescendo and a steady bass line is established that develops into a more familiar groovy beat. Confusion Breakbone, on the other hand, begins right off the bat with the bass line and the listener is, within the first few minutes of the song, presented with the song's entire musical landscape. Very early in the song, the listener gets a sense of the feel, or to put it differently, the state of mind to which Confusion Breakbone appeals. Mm. <laughs> in, in some way, in some way, um, in some way, Fela approaches Confusion with an air of optimism and youthful vitality in a way that he does not in Confusion Breakbone. In other words, where Confusion looks ahead, Confusion Breakbone looks back. And so this is, this is almost two decades apart, and the, the argument I'm trying to make is that the, stylistic, the stylistic differences between Confusion and Confusion Breakbone, which are speaking to the same reality, the same um, political reality, might give us an inkling into what the state of mind of Felakuti was across across these two decades. And here I offer a tentative hypothesis for what that might mean. While the sonic and stylistic divergence of both songs might appear insignificant, I argue that a closer reading of the songs might offer crucial insights into Fela's emotional state at the times of their release. Nearly two decades apart, after the release of Confusion, Fela's music and politics had ended in a fair state of trauma, a fair share of trauma and suffering at the hands of the state. And this also goes back to the, the talk we've been having about the place of the artist in the state, where do, how does the artist position himself in relation to the state and patronage. Under the weight of what Achille Mbembe frames as the banality of power, Fela and his associates had become vulnerable targets of state-sponsored violence. Unarguably, his oppositional music inspired the most obscene reaction from the state. By 1980, roughly, Six years into publishing music, blatantly critical of the military establishment, Fela had suffered two major raids to his compound, one, of which, um, one in which his mother lost her life. Within this time, he had been framed for marijuana possession and foreign currency smuggling. Each allegation earned him prison terms. Both of these, um, besides these more spectacular acts of violence, Fela also suffered like more subtle um, bureaucratic violence, uh, for lack of a better word. For example, the failure of the states to register his political party, um, CIA being infiltrating, infiltrating his, um, his, his shrine where, where he performs. Um, so just, uh, they, they were, he's experienced both the public, the spectacular violence, and the more subtle, subtle violence. So I'm arguing that the convergence of, of these layers or these um, experiences of violence contributed in shaping um, what we see in Confucian Breakbone as a rumination, as, as a, thank you. <laughs> so in Confucian Breakbone, we hear in the sonic texture of the song, as well as in the lyrics, Fela's weariness from years of violence, 
In the song's opening lines, Fela remarks his experience of violence as the critical departure between the personas we see in Confusion and in Confusion Break Boom. In other words, at the time of singing Confusion, quote, Ami never burned my house, which meant, to translate, the Ami had not burned my house. This reference to an experience of violence frames the ensuing narrative of exhaustion that we see here. In the same way that Fela grafts himself as part of the environment of confusion, he implicates his, listeners, his listening public in that state of confusion. In this song, the listener is enlisted as a witness in this world of introspection that Fela enacts in CBB, a world complicated by the tension between Fela's exuberant commentary and an underlying melancholia. For an artist whose art and politics relied on posturing masculinity, and externalizing bravery, CBB becomes a telling sign, a troublesome departure. I offer that, at the, frustration, I offer that the frustration we witness fellow experience in CBB and the environment that produces that frustration marks fellow's life as tragic. In the same vein, the, tra the naive optimism with which fellow confronted power, imagine both as whether we want to imagine power as an ephemeral concept or as, um, as a tangible thing. And the dialectic interplay between actions, reactions, and events that led up to his death frames, um, frames him as a tragic protagonist. Hmm. Last paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to clarify that to imagine Fela as a tragic protagonist is not to discredit the, pro the profound the profoundly positive aspects of his life and works, not to determine, uh, to, not to undermine Afrobeat's contribution to contemporary African, contemporary African political thoughts. Far from this, to think about Fela in terms, in these terms, I mean in the terms of tragedy, is to appreciate with a greater sense of urgency the rawness of his suffering. Not in messianic time, in, in, not in the terms of, of, not in messianic times, but in the terms of contemporariness of being embedded in the same environment of confusion that he paints in TBB. To frame it differently, that is to say, the death that kills a person's contemporary is talking to that person in Proverbs. <laughs> to imagine Fela as a tragic protagonist, to imagine Fela as a tragic protagonist is to first come to a consensus that he is in fact dead. Many people wouldn't like to agree that he's dead, but he's in fact dead. And that he is a collateral waste of an embattled nation state. Second, this imagination of tragedy that I propose places on us a duty to perform a conceptual autopsy, which will determine not only the immediate cause or cost of death, but also gesture towards an understanding of the impossibility of non-death in the face of Fela's radical optimism. This conceptual autopsy places upon us the challenge of scribbling into the mar margins of Afrobeat scholarship a vocabulary that comprehends failure. Thank you very much. I think 10 minutes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Chin Rachebe. Things fall apart. No, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Chin Rachebe's uh, last book, There Was a Country. Um, I'm not going to talk about the contents of the book, which I'm sure some of you have read, although I'm tempted to because I think with so many Yoruba people and enough Igbo people here, you might be able to uh, start a nice boxing match, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I want to begin my paper with um, the epigraphs that I start the paper with, uh, and I'll tell you who, who makes these statements. The first one is Chin Rajaba himself. He says, writers don't give prescriptions, they give headaches. And I think everyone would agree that he gave a big headache to lots of people with his last book. Uh, another, the next two are um, online comments to, uh, it was, I'm interested in the sort of re the reaction to the two books, Things Fall Apart and There Was a Country. The very different reactions and the different ways that readers approach these two books. One, of course, a work of fiction, the other one not. The uh, other two quotations, the, the second one is, uh, There Was a Country is another fine novel. 
from the master. Now, I don't know if this person is using the word novel in the way that we normally mean fiction, or, they, you know, or they're using it in the way that many of my American students use it to mean any book. I think this is a Nigerian who's probably using it to mean novel, but I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. And then the last one is, again, uh, online, uh, an online comment. It says, Chief, and I'll try and read it. It's, I think it was written on a phone, so it's that kind of phone language. Chief at Chabé, just disappoint everybody with that irrelevant comment about Chief uh, Bafemi Awolo. We'll try that with one Aboki people like Amadou Bello. And I, all the, you know, there's some mistakes in terms of the names. Uh, by now, thousand could have been killed in the north. Elders should always behave like one. This is not what this country need now. So someone who obviously was very upset with the book. Um, even before the book came out, a lot of people began the, the kind of frenzy, frenzied reaction to uh, the book already started. And that really interested me a great deal uh, for a number of reasons, in part because I teach things fall apart, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, things fall apart. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what fascinates me was the ways in which people reacted to it. And so there were people who supported the book, of course, a lot. They hadn't seen the book. And then there were people who really rejected the book and said, um, and I quote, you know, for example, somebody said, uh, it's just fiction posing as fact. Um, so a lot of people rejected the book based on its authenticity. That was the, the major uh, online, I'm talking about online, commentariat to what people were saying about the book online. Uh, now, uh, the, the problems that people had with the book were things that I won't get into the context, but for those who haven't read the book, uh, a lot of the focus on about Chinua Chabe's presentation of Awolowo and what Awolowo felt about Igbo people. Um, uh, Again, I want to be clear, not all Igbo people supported the book and not all Yoruba people uh, uh, rejected the book. But there was, you know, there tended to be, you'd read the names of the commentators and the Igbos were usually praising the book, which they hadn't read. And the Yoruba people were often, uh, you know, saying, Achebe is a terrible man. How could this elder do this uh, uh, without having read the book? Um, I, I want to just point very quickly to two people who did, in fact, read the book um, and, and had some measured things to say. One, uh, an Igbo uh, who will be familiar, familiar to, I think, all of you, Okain Dibe, who said that Achebe's, you know, who's very sympathetic uh, uh, reading of the book. He says, Achebe's take on Awolowo, the charismatic, disciplined, and austere man, widely revered in the Southwest, is one of the rare moments when the book becomes strident. So for him, the book was great. There were a few problems. But, and, and, and you know, he, he turned to this uh, problem with uh, Awolo Wom. OK, let me quickly move back then and talk a little bit about uh, the reception to Things Fall Apart. I think everybody knows some of the statistics, you know, 50 million copies in print. No, 12 million copies in print, uh, 50 different languages, or maybe 60 languages. So this is, you know, talk, speaking about uh, heroes. The previous speaker was speaking about heroes. The most famous African hero in fiction, I think, is undoubtedly uh, Okonkwo. <laughs> uh, people all over the world, from China to wherever. Um, in 2008, there was, it was the 50th anniversary, of course, of the book, so there was lots of occasion to celebrate and look back. The, even the Library of Congress had, uh, had uh, a, a one-day symposium where they brought all kinds of scholars. Norton published a special you know, 50th edition. Uh, other, there were other 50th editions published by other publishers. People in India published uh, volumes looking at Achebe's work. Um, I think you know the, the interesting, most interesting thing to me as a historian about the treatment of things fall apart in the 50 years since it's been published is this consistent treatment of it um, as wonderful, primarily because it is authentic. It's the historicity of things fall apart that mostly people have celebrated. The fact that it uh, captures, as for example, um, you know Ruth. Franklin, who's a, a book critic uh, uh, in, in the US, says, our Western reviews praised Achebe's detailed portrayal of Igbo life. It's this, this idea that Achebe, things fall apart, captures the essence of uh, 19th century, early 20th century uh, Nigeria or Igbo society. Um, it's what you know. someone has called, uh, Carrie Snyder has called, the aura of authenticity about the novel. So it's this idea of authentic. It's very authentic. It's historically accurate, the historicity. But this is a novel. Mm -hmm. 
This is a novel. So, so this is a novel. This is a novel. Um, you know, this is a novel. Uh, you know, I, I just want to very quickly quote a couple of other critics. Um, David Cowell praised the novel, you know, said it's the great skill with which Achebe combines the role of novelist and anthropologist, synthesizes a new kind of fiction. This is where his essential genius lies. Um, but, you know, it's not only Western readers who do this. I think uh, all of us as Nigerians, most of us, many of us, I myself as an Igbo person, I know many people say, oh, yes, well, Achebe said, this is how they used to do it. You know, people would quote me Achebe about how things were done in 19th century Igbo land. Uh, and, well, I could not argue with them, despite the fact that I'm a historian. Uh, so it's not only Westerners who've, who've celebrated this authentic aspect of the novel, of the authenticity. Uh, Kalu Oba, an Igbo literary scholar, you know, affirms that things fall apart as an authentic information source on the 19th century Igbo and their neighbors. <laughs> Okay, and um, there are, of course, many voices who say, hang on, wait a minute, this is a novel, so, you know, we should be careful. Um, but old habits die hard. I think that it's very hard to let go of these ideas of things fall apart as uh, speaking authentically to the past. So the thing that interested me, because I do use things fall apart in my own courses, I teach things fall apart. Uh, and always it is with... Um, you know, I always find it difficult because people do approach the book and say, oh, well, now I know the Igbo. I mean, I read it. I, I, and while history doesn't work that way, and even within the novel, of course, itself, the Chinua Achebe points to the fact that even within Igbo society, there's lots of differences. You know, some of you may remember Okongwa going to his mother's family and then finding that they're too effeminate, unlike his own community, right? Um, but there's a way in which things fall apart is always treated as history or anthropology. Or gospel, and here's a work of and here's a work of fiction, and so I was fascinated by the commentary online about there was a country because here is a work of ostensibly nonfiction, right? And so the charges against it, the most persistent charges were that it was not authentic, that it was not factual, that it was as the first uh, epigraph, second one I, I read said that it was actually um, a novel, and so it, and and I think. Uh, I, 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 I think that we then have to think about, um, you know, how do we treat, uh, who, who, how, do we, how do you understand the past, especially a very traumatic experience, right? I think that there's a way in which we can all agree, okay, 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 so, okay. <laughs> um, how, do we, how do you understand the past? Earlier, the, 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 the panel this morning, you were talking about the ways in which historians can use images, and we do can use you know, images, paintings to study the past. You know, how can we use fiction, whether it's a novel, a song, or painting? Um, but which speaks more truthfully to the past or about the past? Is it fiction? Or is it nonfiction? And I think that the, there's a question about um, things like civil wars or other traumatic moments, right? And I think, of course, for example, of the Holocaust or closer to Africa, I mean, in, in Africa, the Rwandan genocide. There's an argument, I think, perhaps to be made, and some people have made that argument, that to, to understand, to, to enter into the truth of such a traumatic event as the Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide, that sometimes fiction works more effectively. Can, fiction allows you to understand the essence of a thing in a way that you can't with, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, non-fiction. And I had a, 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 a quotation here, which I've lost since I, okay, let me just kind of read it. It's uh, Ngugi, you know, Ngugi who talks about, for him, for example, how things fall apart, enabled him to understand uh, the essence of Igbo society in ways that he couldn't understand from a textbook or from his history teacher. He said uh, that the novel, um, he talk, I, I can't get the quotation right here because I'm jumping around, but he talks about the yam, how you know they'd been reading about the yam and his teacher had explained, but it was in actually reading and things fall apart that he was able to understand the function of yam in Igbo society. So my paper is really to invite everyone to, this, to, to, to discuss and to think about this idea how does fiction, can fiction be read as history? Can nonfiction be discounted as fiction? Who has the right to say that somebody's nonfiction, that somebody's memoirs are fiction? 
Uh, in, in other words, Achebe's book is obviously, uh, has been, you know, it, it's it, uh, a witness statement, right, as, as it's been called by some critics. It's, he is bearing testament to having lived through the Biafran Civil War, the Nigerian Civil War. And he says it's, the, it's a, a personal history. That's the um, subtitle of the book. So I asked the question, can we treat his memoir as fiction, as a novel, and yet treat his fiction as history? Is this a problem? Or is this not a problem? I mean, maybe fiction does speak more truthfully to the past, especially to traumatic moments, I don't know. But I think that, you know, the, the, the obviously you see I don't discuss Achebe or anything about whether genocide or not. We can save that for later. But, but I do think that Achebe has done uh, a fantastic job of opening up a discussion about the civil war in ways that we've never had in Nigeria, right? I think that, uh, so it's interesting that this work of fiction, of nonfiction, has actually allowed us to begin to talk about the civil war in way, publicly in ways that the works of n fiction have not. I mean, Adichie's book, of course, was a huge bestseller, but even that didn't lead to the public discussion that we're having now about uh, the civil war. And I will end uh, with two, uh, and I've kept you my time, I've, I'll end, and I will now read, I'll end with two uh, uh, quotations. One from uh, Elie Wiesel, who wrote, of course, who was, of course, a survivor of the Holocaust and wrote, you know, Night, right? And, you know, Elie Wiesel uh, has said that a novel about Auschwitz is not fiction. Oh, it's not a novel. Uh, is that a riddle? Well, you know, you, we can decide that later. And then I will end with Achebe his, himself. I mean, of course, many of you know the, the famous quotation where Achebe said, uh, uh, art for art's sake is deodorized dog shit. Uh, but that's not the one I wanted to get to. Uh, I want to end with Achebe, him, you know, who says, the world is like a mask, dance, uh, a mask dancing. If you want to see it well, you do not stand in one place. Okay, thank you. I'm going to actually take you guys to the other end of the continent and uh, explore a little bit, <laughs> throw out a little bit about South Africa. Um, I, um, I had done a previous project on Gandhi, Im uh, images and representations of Gandhi. Um, as you can see, there's two images of him. That's uh, the one on the left is actually the pic a picture of him in South Africa. He was in South Africa from 1893 to 1914. Um, so um, I actually study the early anti-apartheid, the early apartheid era post-World War II. So very early. Um, Gandhi actually dies in 1948, and that's when apartheid's instituted, just to kind of give you guys um, the gist of it. The picture on the right, obviously, is probably the one that's better known internationally um, and recognized um, by the ma majority of people in the world, and that's the quote-unquote Indian version of Gandhi, or the one that um, was struggling for national independence. Um, and so that was basically my previous uh, argument was looking at the Indian pin, Opinion, which was his uh, newspaper that he created while he was in South Africa. It's a South African newspaper. It was used by the uh, Indian Congress here in, in, in Natal. Um, and uh, in 1949, which is the year that I was interested in, way after when Gandhi was here, um, I, I was looking at how he was being used in the anti-apartheid struggle. And so a couple of things I found in my previous research basically was that the, the quote on the left shows that he was kind of deified, um, which is that, you know, he's compared to Jesus, God, th these sorts of things. And then naturally this image on the right. The interesting thing is both of these are the Indian, quote unquote, Indian versions of Gandhi. And so I thought it was really interesting that they're actually being portrayed to South Africans. Um, so last summer, this past summer, I was actually in Durban. And I was doing some interviews with uh, some... Uh, people who were active during the passive resistance campaign in 1946, um, which is right before the apartheid started. The, the, there's a long history to it, which I don't really have time to go into, so we can, I can answer questions later on it. But one of my interviews was actually the gentleman on the right. He's the guy with the newspapers. His name is Harry Prasad. He goes by Harry. And um, he was 16 in that picture. He, um, so he was actually very active in 1946 with the passive resistance campaign. That passive resistance campaign used the ideals of Gandhi. So 
what got me thinking about this was I went to his house. On the way to his house, the guy I was staying with told me, this guy has this really cool picture of Gandhi. You have to, you just wait until you see this picture of Gandhi. So I'm like, all right, I'm so excited. And I get there, there's three pictures in his whole sitting room. One big one of Gandhi praying, which is similar to this one. It's not quite the exact same one, but it's similar. So obviously the Indian version, the older man um, fighting for the nationalist, nationalist um, movement in India. And then he's got two other pictures, small little ones of his deceased parents. So I was like, wow, okay. So obviously just the prominence, right? And then the fact that he, it's that that's the version that he has and that this guy has been active. He's and politically active and active socially within the Indian community. So I kind of started wondering and kind of re-questioning what it was exactly that I, I guess I understood um, as his image being used, essentially, in the anti-apartheid movement. So this summer I also went, oops, oh, they're out of order, okay. So I also went to the Phoenix Settlement, which is where Gandhi, Gandhi established it in 1903 when he was in um, South Africa. And it was basically a settlement. It lasted up until, well, roughly about 1985 when it was destroyed by a riot. But it, it was uh, open to all the ethnicities, which so it was kind of attacked by the government a lot, but it was kind of a safe haven. And it was also where his printing press was for the Indian opinion and so on. It was burned down in 1985, um, but then it was rebuilt a few years ago, and it's now included in the Ananda Heritage um, route, So, um, which is interesting because it's actually um, a, a very much an African area now. And so going through the, the museum, obviously there's lots of images of Gandhi. The bust on the left, you can't really get the scale from it, but this bust is huge. I mean, it's huge. I couldn't even like hug it. It was gigantic. But there's fresh garland of flowers on it, and, and it had this own little like pagoda around it, um, uh, kind of sheltering it from the weather. And the same with the, the things on the right. And those are just some of the other uh, representations of Gandhi. One thing that I found really interesting um, Oh, and you can't totally see, but this exhibit on the left, there's this tiny little picture, and it's the picture of Gandhi, but it's the image of him from when he was in South Africa. And then you have all of these different boards, and they go all the way around the room. And the, each one is different places in the world throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century of different nonviolent movements. So it's kind of, they're, they're trying to connect all of these massive nonviolent movements to um, Gandhi, which of course, but it's not the, the, the Indian Gandhi, it's the South African one, which I thought was kind of brilliant actually. Um, and then there's also like, the, the one on the right there, it's actually titled, I know it's really difficult for you to see, but the title is South Africa, the Nursery of Mahatma Gandhi's Experiments with Truth, which it, it, he often, is, he's credited with founding the, his nonviolent movements in South Africa. Um, but the really interesting part um, is that it, it goes on to say that the, um, his nonviolent satyagraha was observed and studied, albeit from a distance, by the black leadership. The unshackling of the majestic personality of black power in South Africa is the culmination of the same fight. So the, this, um, they're trying to basically kind of, um, I guess, use the image of Gandhi to connect or um, to integrate these movements which in the 1940s and 50s, from a lot of primary sources I've been looking at, you don't see a lot of evidence for. So there's definitely like reimagining going on, especially in, in, in the museum here. I found something similar, actually. Oops, sorry, not concluding yet. Just real quick, the Apartheid Museum I also visited in Johannesburg. And I saw something very similar there as well, where they also were talking about the 1946 Passive Resistance Campaign. And they made, um, there were two different exhibits, and they made very clear connections. This is a quote from Nelson Mandela crediting Gandhi. And then there's also, um, with, with this philosophy inspiring him, and then there was also um, another one where it talked about it and made a clear distinction, uh, like a direct lineage between 1908, Mohandas Gandhi, nonviolence movement. 1946, passive resistance, anti-apartheid movement, and then connections directly to the ANC. And so I thought that was really interesting um, because when Gandhi was actually in South Africa, he did not advocate for Africans at all. He was very much participating for Indians, and oftentimes elite Indians, until the very end of his time in South Africa. So the majority, he was here for 21 years, and about eight, 17 of those 
were actually spent advocating for the elites and the Indians, which is a really, really, really small group. And so and he didn't advocate for Africans at all. So I thought it was interesting that um, they're trying to kind of reposition this philosophy um, and, and I guess reuse him, repackage him in, in kind of interesting ways. So in conclusion, I was trying to keep it short. Um, in conclusion, um, basically, I actually don't know at this point. It's just really complex. I was at a point where I thought, okay, it makes sense in the 40s and 50s. But now when I, when it, especially the museums, I was just, I was shocked actually. And I don't know if I was excited or what, but it was, it was very interesting to kind of see how the images are being manipulated in different ways and how you have these, basically these two different versions and depending on what you want to say, it says different things. And it means a lot for the South African Indian community. So th there's actually a lot of weight behind these images. So thank you. <laughs>
Nonetheless, Ruggieri's maps vividly illustrate uh, illustrated every early modern European and Chinese cultural exchanges through his employment of both European and Chinese cartographic techniques and knowledge, which differed in many ways. Early modern European and Chinese cartography served different purposes and employed different techniques. Many European maps ser served to help the discoveries of foreign lands for the purpose of conquests. Accuracy and descriptions were therefore crucial for an early modern European map. Chinese maps, however, mainly tended to administrative concerns tailored to assist the ruling of territories. Chinese maps were fluid, and accuracy was not the emphasis. In addition, seas and oceans were often portrayed in Chinese maps uh, um, as threatening aspects, quote, unquote. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, in addition, seas and oceans were often portrayed in Chinese maps um, as threatening aspects, as waves rather than a calm sea were usually illustrated. Lattice grids were often employed in Chinese maps as well. Many, uh, Chinese, many Chinese maps were divided into grids, with one grid being the equivalent of 100 li, or 33 miles. Using lattice grids, distances were easily measured. Moreover, Chinese maps seldom featured legends as were common in European maps. Ruggieri focused on both natural landscape as well as man-made structures and important locations in his maps. In addition to natural resources such as seas, rivers, and mountains to illustrate the landscape and passageways for traveling purposes, Ruggieri included forts and major cities. Ruggieri also used the lattice grids for his general map of China and many of his provincial maps. However, some of his maps also included European coordinates. Ruggieri's map of Liaodong illustrates this hybridity. After his own map of um, the Northeast province, the Jesuit included a Chinese map of the same province. It isn't clear why Ruggieri added this particular map, uh, this particular Chinese map in his atlas, but the inclusion not only allows a comparison of the two maps, but also reveals the source of the Ch Jesuits' work, providing a visible link between Ruggieri's cartographic work to Chinese mapping. It is likely that Ruggieri referenced the Chinese map in his own compilation of Liaodong. Not only were um, Ruggieri's outline of the province and the inclusion of such features as mountains, rivers, and the Great Wall similar to the Chinese map and conventional Chinese map making, the Jesuit also adopted the Chinese use of lattice grid for his own map. However, Ruggieri included a scale in his version. In addition, he did not illustrate the sea in waves as a threat, as was portrayed in the Chinese map according to conventional Chinese map making. This shows that while Ruggieri drew some of his materials from Chinese cartography, he retained certain European techniques in his own map making. Although no direct political impact resulted from Ruggieri's mapping, Ruggieri's atlas was a detailed measurement of the Middle Kingdom, which had been famous in European imagination through travel accounts by such travelers as Marco Polo. Ruggieri's maps marked a pioneering effort in illustrating China in a concrete, detailed, and visual manner as he showcased each province. This pre-modern practice of measurement was significant as Ruggieri drew boundaries of the country of each of his provinces and outlined its natural resources, its cities, military strength, and agricultural products. Ruggieri's work blurred and complicated the boundaries between pre-modern and modern cartographic practices. The organization of Ruggieri's atlas also warrants some attention. After a general map of the entire Great Ming country, Ruggieri presented a map of the southernmost Guangdong province before introducing provinces along the southeastern and eastern coastlines. Ruggieri then included a map of the capital before focusing on the central region. Ruggieri um, then included maps of the southwest before returning to the central provinces. The uniqueness of this order becomes obvious compared to Martini's 1655 atlas. Beginning with Beijing, the capital, Martini, arranged the, prov the provincial maps and descriptions from the north to central China before moving along the eastern and southeastern coastlines and ending his descriptions in the southwest provinces. The different order and orientation are telling. While Martini focused first and foremost on Beijing, the Chinese capital where the emperor resided, Ruggieri prioritized the more marginalized regions in the south of the Chinese empire. Moreover, Ruggieri included four maps of Guangdong in his atlas, more than any other provinces. This shows the attention Ruggieri paid to the province far away from the Chinese kingdom, uh, Chinese capital. Ruggieri's interest in the South could be a result of his own journey to China from Europe in the late 1570s. From Goa to Macau, Ruggieri and his fellow Jesuits entered China through the South, and Ruggieri spent his years in China in the southernmost Guangdong province. As he did not travel extensively in China, Ruggieri was undoubtedly more familiar with the southern region. 
Although Martini also produced provincial maps, his main interest was Beijing. Ruggieri began from the south from where he entered China, not only because he was more familiar with the region, but also because they shared a local perspective. Unlike Martini, Ruggieri even included detailed descriptions of Hainan Island, the southernmost part of the Chinese empire. To conclude, as the founding father of the China mission in the late 16th century, Ruggieri was a significant missionary in his own right. His Atlas of China is also a significant piece of work scholars have yet to examine. Although his Atlas remained manuscript maps, it fills a gap. Almost 50 years before Blau's publication of Martini's Maps of China in the mid-17th century, Ruggieri compiled this series of maps that not only included a significant amount of details of the Middle Kingdom, but also employed both European and Chinese cartographic uh, techniques and knowledge. Along with Ricci and, Mar and Martini, Ruggieri was a pioneer, not only because he helped build the Jesuit mission in China or produced important religious and scholarly works, but also because he diligently compiled a set of detailed maps on China that furthered our understanding of East-West encounters. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Um, my name is Dushabe. You might see Caroline Dushabe, Dushabe what Dushabe, but it's Dushabe, so uh, Dushabe what Dushabe is correct. Um, I, I want to, I have how many minutes? How many minutes do I have? Nine. 10? Not nine, okay, 10, okay. So <laughs> I wanna use one min minute to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Falola uh, in the context of why we are here uh, uh, celebrating the work of uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, J.D. Because uh, uh, Felani, yes. yeah, you uh, uh, characterized uh, Professor J.D. as an educator, a mentor, and I want to say that uh, to uh, Follow as well, because um, that's what he is in my life since I got to know him, you know, not long, long ago. Uh, I wish I'd known him when I was much younger. <laughs> the marriage. <laughs> 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 um, because I was hesitant to present here today uh, because I'm not an historian. I appreciate art, but I don't really understand it, you know, because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I was working on other things and I wasn't prepared to, uh, uh, to be at this conference. But as a mentor, you know, uh, he said, find something to present. And so usually when I go, I do my research in Uganda, and when I go to do research in Uganda, I go wanting to do one research and I see so many things. So I'm always collecting narratives and narratives and narratives that I hope in the future will find meaning you know, about. So this is one of, one of those projects I hoped you know, I would begin working on in uh, perhaps next three years. So since he pushed me, now I have to you know, keep moving with it. So, <laughs> so this is what it is. It's a, a, a rough skeleton, uh, perhaps doesn't have a head, but it's an idea that I'm working with and I'm just gonna share with you where I am with this. So I thank you so much. All right, so... Um, I perhaps began to um, think about the world during uh, Amin's time, okay? And so he, you know, he came to power in 1971. You know Amin, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and, um, and since he was ousted in 1979, there is a way in which Uganda has remembered him by forgetting him. Because uh, many people, for a long time, you could see the anger, you know, and I, I, I grew up in the fear uh, of Amin and everybody who was attached to him. So as I go to do other research, uh, 
me, I ask questions and, you know, I, I, I ask, I, I hear people uh, talk about things. And uh, the narrative about Amin is that uh, when he came to power, uh, he, he had something against the Asians. And they, people, it, it, I'm talking about ordinary people, you know, who don't write history, who don't read history, just people in their communities, who experienced Amin's you know, uh, regime and brutality, and who have responded to it in a different way. So he uh, expelled the Indian community, so that's what you hear. And uh, it, it was because uh, the Indian community was becoming intolerant of uh, Ugandans, especially men, mistreating people and taking everything, property, land, you know, uh, lives. And so that's why Amin expelled them. So that's what people have in their heads. So I have taken interest as things developed during my other research to get to know what people know about Amin. And so what I hear in the narrative is that whether it's fact or fiction or what people know, is that for Ugandans, this narrative about Amin gives them a sense, two senses simultaneously. One, a sense of citizenship that claims Uganda for Ugandans, right? To defend it as theirs. And another sense is a sense of citizenship that was violated by everything senseless, that's how people put it, that Amin committed against their fellow, his fellow Ugandans. So this latter sense, or the senselessness of uh, their citizenship, uh, drives Ugandans to the, the, uh, the associate from Amin and the history that covers Amin's time. So it's like a, a, a before colonization, all that history is gone, it's not there. Then we come and when we reach Amin, we jump over <laughs> to um, <laughs> So because we skip Amin's time, he's forgotten. Also the Indians are forgotten. And Indians who are citizens in Uganda are stripped of their citizenship. Because in the feeling of, now I call them African Ugandans and Indian Ugandans, okay. So in the African Ugandans, uh, w they feel that their citizenship was stripped by a means, you know, uh, brutality. So they forget everything within that time. So they also forget the Asians, the Indians, you know, uh, as citizens and also non-citizens who are in Uganda who were expelled by a mean. So the relationship between uh, Indian Ugandans and African Ugandans is something that is in the background of all things, but it will occasionally be retrieved to silence demands of ac accountability from the government. So if, for example, uh, people ask for accountability, President Museveni, who has been in power for as long as I have lived, will say, you do not remember Oh, no, you have forgotten Amin, okay? So he's, he's not <laughs> saying that by reminding them of Amin, which he is doing, but he's doing it to threaten them that if they have forgotten what Amin did to them, then they are not appreciating what he's doing, okay? Maybe he's going further that I will do the same, you know, <laughs> that I'm not going to you. So through I mean, uh, 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 Ugandans feel that their humanity is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, stripped of them and uh, their citizen, uh, citizenship as well. But also to reclaim these two values, they, it means that they have to forget, I mean. Okay, so in the forgetting, and doesn't mean that we don't talk about I mean, but we talk about him as never have existed. In a sense, and we laugh about Amin. And I was thinking about it the other day because I did the same thing. I was reflecting about it as I was thinking about this paper. We remember, are you sure? <laughs> uh, okay. We, we remember Amin through our relationship with colonialism. 
So uh, we remember him through broken English he used to speak. So for example, when he was invited by the Queen of England for dinner, after eating, he was satisfied, but he said he was uh, yeah, he said, I'm fed up. When you come to Uganda, we revenge. <laughs> so, and, and this, this is, and I don't know the meaning of it, but it's important to me as I work through this because uh, we remember him by failing to speak correct English because during, through school, Almost every Ugandan will tell you that they were punished, beaten, for speaking their own languages and not speaking English. And so it is, I don't know what it means, but it's really significant that that is the way we choose to remember Amin, but we don't remember him through other meaningful discourses. <laughs> so as I was you know, asking people uh, what they wanted, what they knew about Amin, um, uh, one person said, eh, and I was asking, you know, educated people, like, you know, doctors, you know, some of these were retired people, nurses, so who worked during Amin's time? And I said, eh, ebya amin ibuka jenana amin. Meaning, we were to translate to Lucy, I just don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Say, ah, um, issues that have to do with Amin went with Amin. So we can't talk about anything that happened during Amin's time. So I have you know, similar uh, uh, testimonies, but I want to go to them. I just want to say why really this captures my attention. I see a nationalism, especially since Museven came to uh, uh, power, a nationalism that is based on silence and forgetting in which Amin is the focus. And the moment is also one in which Indian Ugandans are erased from the picture of citizenship in Uganda. And so the meaning I'm going after, I'm looking for what it would open up for me, you know, if opening up these wounds that Ugandans fear are facing in the act of remembering Amin would reveal about all the, all the uh, heroic nationalist uh, or nationalist, nationalist works of uh, good neighborliness that happened during Amin's time and after Amin left, because we didn't have a government even, even though we had a government. Uh, people in villages had to address the issues themselves, you know, like build schools, maintain hospitals, you know, uh, security or things like that. Many were sleeping in bushes at night, trying to protect the homes in their neighborhood. So, because we don't talk about a means time, we don't talk about what citizens did. And so then we also don't talk about actually the meaning of citizenship that people have really pursued and participated in and built. So that's what I'm going for, but I just don't know what this. And uh, just maybe to end with a quote from Mamdani. You know Mamdani is Uganda. He's third generation Indian in Uganda. and. Uh, um, Reflecting on uh, 20 years of uh, uh, Indians, you know, being uh, expelled from Uganda and now b having been uh, invited back uh, by M7, uh, he remembers these days. He, 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 he contextualizes this incident of the expulsion of Indians uh, within racism. Racism, colonial racism against Ugandans racism among Indians because the most rich and the poor, you know, the caste system, you know, followed them all the way uh, to uh, Uganda. And racism from Indian community as a whole against Ugandans. And so this is what he experienced. He said, this racism was internalized to the point of self-denial, leading African progressive intellectuals to pretend to be universal intellectuals. Quote, if you were in Uganda, the mark of your progressiveness, if you are in Uganda, the mark of your progressiveness, I think I missed something here, was that you consciously avoided speaking or writing in Uganda. If you were an Asian, you considered yourself apart from the Asian question. So this, this integration, this self-forgetting uh, interests me in 
relation to how people actually remember by forgetting, I mean, and that's what I'm following. Thanks. <laughs> It's really just a comment, uh, co commenting on uh, Anenis and uh, Carolyn uh, work, because I think both of them call for something that is not really pushed as, as, as the most important uh, in the agenda for, for political change in Africa, which is the idea of a truth and reconciliation. Because when I really look at remembering, I mean, when, when we talk about uh, the whole debate that was ensued after the uh, 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 Chin is published, uh, his uh, memoirs uh, is really there was no forum for people to really speak about the past and the atrocities of the past. That's why we will always have this kind of conflict, whatever you cast it in terms of uh, the difference between fiction and fiction, read as history or as memoirs. Um, because I think that is uh, the question you raised, are of course, very important in terms of reading of these two works uh, because they both call for, you know, we write with, the, everybody write with an audience in mind. Uh, there is the, you know, subjectivity element there. And, 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 and uh, of course, uh, Achebe is not an exception. <laughs> he has his own emotional feeling about the past and so forth. But it's really about that issue that we could not, you know, I mean, the idea of transitional justice becomes really very important for Africa in moving forward. And that's why I think I, I really hail the South African for the experiment of whatever the problem with it, it is an important model uh, uh, to emulate and, and to think about. I mean, of course, there are other models, but uh, those cannot happen easily unless you defeat the injustice completely and you establish democratic rule, which is, well, let's say, the Nuremberg trial, <laughs> or uh, uh, the amnesty thing, which was happening in, in, in uh, in the, Lat in the Latin American case, uh, the idea of giving amnesty, blanket amnesty, in exchange for military, you know, 
privilege to leave, but that's caused exactly the same problem, which is some form of amnesia, from amnesty to amnesia or selective memory. I, I just think it is important to push for the truth and reconciliation issue. The first presenter on tragedy, I uh, would love to hear your response in terms of other models of tragedy that you investigated, because I somehow I uh, have a slight critique of you know that model, which is dated and cannot contain uh, a fellow paradigm. What is your critique of the model? Is that it is, uh, it is uh, ancient and restrictive. You haven't in said anything. What is your critique of it? <laughs> yeah. I believe I um, the Aristotelian model, right? Yes, that's what you used. Uh, Fela was not a king or royalty. Uh, uh, it was a common man's uh, hero. And uh, uh, there is the tragedy of the common man, and you have to factor in the social So my question is to okay. my question. Uh, it's to KC. I know your research is still at the preliminary stage, but I'm curious to how you will how you think about. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> how you will consider um, the production of heritage in South Africa, which is a very big business in South Africa, and the politics of of uh, nation building, or what you call uh, rainbow, rainbow nation. So how would you think about that uh, uh, in relation to uh, the, the monumentalization of, of Gandhi, who, like you said, wasn't really invested uh, in, in, in the social space of South Africa, really, and the broader social space of South Africa at that point? I know you have too many other questions. Please, you will respond. So I just want to say that. So the civil war thing, I think there are fundamental problems which is very unusual. It is a case in which there is no archive. You understand? There is no war archive. Mm -hmm. So there are newspapers and people's memories. Mm -hmm. So which means that between now and the end of the world, nobody can acquire any authority writing on the Nigerian Civil mm -hmm. War. Because you cannot write on a war without an archive. So they miss that moment in creating a war archive. And that's, that's a fundamental problem. And the second issue is the one that fascinates me the, the most is somebody has to write on silence. So you have the largest segment of the country not saying anything at all. Yeah, the answer. From the edges of Biafra to the Sahara Desert, they don't say anything. <laughs> so I if people don't say anything, <coughs> right, you already know that that's, that's problematic by itself. Mm -hmm. In which one side is talking? The larger side that they are two things says, okay, I'm not going to talk. <laughs> what does that silence mean? And somebody has to write about that silence because it's actually far more important than those who are talking. Silence is forgetting. They are not forgetting. Oh, we don't know that. We don't know. How do you write about them when they don't talk? You see, that's the answer. Right, the whole issue, you know, I, I don't quite agree with uh, Father Dan Descent that because of there wasn't an archive created, it it means that we can't move forward. I'm not sure. No, I didn't say we can't say okay. so no archive. Right. But, right, but it's never too late. I think that the point that Sally made is that the, we have to speak about it and memorialize it and talk about it and find a model that works for us. I mean, but but I, I think, uh, and I think that Achebe may have provided that uh, an opening. Um, there were, you made a lot of interesting comments uh, uh, about uh, uh, sort of context and temporality, and I think, right, that's right. I mean, when Achebe writes about the colonial period, right, in, a, in a Nigeria, just about to become an independent state, everyone can rally around that. It's, you know, 1958, right? Everyone is becoming an independent state, and, you know, stock it to the white man kind of thing, right? So we can all rally around behind that. But now there was a country, but, but it's a moment where it's that rupture, right, within that state. 
And it, 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 the, the book itself is very interesting. I mean, the way that Ajaka writes, um, you know, my evil people. Uh, Awala was his Yoruba people. Uh, uh, Bearden uh, Jaffer did a, a, a review where he, he, the critique there is that Achebe has, you know, in a way sort of abandoned the progressive model, right? Because rather than talking about class, as, as he's always there, he now only talks in the language of ethnicity. Um, and so that's going to be a problem. If you're speaking the language of ethnicity, you know, it's tribalism, right? It's like that's the problem. Uh, that's the charge there. Um, so those in response to your two questions, right? It's you know that's the that presents part of the readers. That the context is important to understand, right? And and then you asked about how Achebe has positioned himself, and I think, you know, he could he's not here now, but he could say, well, I don't position myself as a as a native anthropologist, right? As he's been called, but there are many people could argue that he did. Uh, he often did speak about the fact that you know he consulted the archives, as it were, his older sister. And then the uncles, and you know, but then again at the same time, you know, he also talked about being at the crossroads because he was both of uh, the kind of British education system. His own family was very Christian, but I think you know that 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 aspect of Achebe hasn't been attended to a lot, and I think a lot of it's going to be a little problem because on the one hand, he, many of us think why well, he presents himself as a native anthropologist, right? The, you know, it's, the, it's speaking from the inside perspective. But you know, Achebe was born into a Christian family. Missionaries had been there for you know over fifty years, so that you know that's a generation and a half, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, can I respond to some of your? We're thoughts? just like, <laughs> we're having a problem of uh, interdisciplinary work here mm -hmm. because I have actually dealt with some of these issues in relation to uh, Uche Okeke mm -hmm. and this issue of you know the, the founders of militant et et ethnic ethnically oriented practices in in, in Minnesota schools. And I, I link you to Kekka and Achebe in that, in that essay, or in a specific essay, both were outsiders in Igbo culture. Uh, they were really Igbo culture, literally an outsider. And we, you know, that's not being taken care of. The anthropological viewpoint, remember, the conclusion between Ratu and Christopher Park had the British colonial officer right. conceiving of the whole tragedy as an anthropological right. tragedy. Like he already had a title. So that that's uh, uh, I mean <laughs> the constructive at the very point. Please. Uh, uh, please. Uh, <laughs> who, who wants to respond? Please. Yeah. Uh, the fella. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with uh, the second question about what models am I using? Um, and I know you were alluding to to Aristotle's model of um, imagining a, a character who is pursuing a noble cause, but who is um, um, taken in. Who is, who's, whose fall is then instituted by um, faith. Uh, that's an Aristotelian model. Um, another model I've looked at is the Shoinkan model, who says um, um, tragedy occurs in the spiritual disconnect between the living and the, and the dead. Um, I find these two models inadequate in conceptualizing Fela. Um, I, they're, they're just inadequate, because Fela um, draws us towards the materialist um, idea of tragedy, a, a tragedy that, is, that, that speaks to the oppressions of post-colonial and the colonial power, um, a tragedy of the body that centers um, the body. Uh, but even at that, I find that Aristotle's um, model is, is, is interesting or useful conceptually. Uh, for example, the, the, the concept of peripetia, um, that moment in, 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 in where, where there's a dramatic turnaround. So peripetia helps me to analyze Confucian breakbone as a critical moment in Fela's life where he gives up on the Nigerian situation. Um, where, 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 where Nigeria, where he is, is weighed down by, 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 by the condition that he finds himself in. So these models are inadequate. And so I'm also saying that Fela gives us a different way of thinking about tragedy that speaks, that honors Nigeria's post-colonial condition. That's the first question. To answer the second question, um, I'm not imagining um, tragedy as an end in itself, but I'm using it as a way of... of as a, as a lens of, uh, of, of viewing Fela's work. If, if, we, if we place the, tra the model of tragedy on Fela's work, what insights might it lend us in such a way that we don't get consumed in this celebratory, triumphant narrative? So nar that using tragedy becomes a useful way of understanding Fela's work in a different way, and also understanding the condition within which he works. And so the argument I'm making ultimately is that in this condition, triumph is impossible. Triumph was impossible. It was impossible for Fela to have succeeded 
given the power relations within which, uh, the environment within which he worked. So triumph is not even in the equation at all for him. I think you should also look at, uh, which is also old, but it's, more, it's, it's, a, it's perhaps the closest, uh, August of Wars, uh, the Terror of the Occurrence. Yeah. You should look at that. It, it really locates what you're searching for. Okay. All right. Um, who, who else is responding? Who else? Is that last one? I'll be quicker. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, to respond, actually, that um, I had a really, uh, that was actually where I began to struggle with the, the heritage part. Uh, the Gandhi settlement is actually part of the Ananda heritage route, which means that there, I think there's like 11 different places. All it's, called, it's got a website, it's got brochures that you can pick up at the airport, so it's very touristy. Um, although I was the only one there when I was there. But the, um, and, but the interesting thing is that it's, um, <coughs> it connects like Du, uh, which was the first ANC president. Mandela voted there. Um, so it's making all these connections, and then of course Gandhi settlement is one part of this bigger narrative. Um, and same thing with the apartheid museum. I was actually quite surprised that there was anything to do, that there were actually multiple panels and different things that can make these kind of similar connections, because you don't really feel that with the people that I was meeting. So to me, there was a real disconnect, and it felt very much like the museums were reconstructing or constructing this history that didn't feel real. And at the same time, both places, you, I saw lots of children, lots of school groups. They cater to school groups. Mm -hmm. So then that was kind of telling as far as like the future for this history that they're creating in these museums. Um, I don't know if it's hopeful or frustrating um, because I don't know how accurate it is based on what I've been reading and from the 1940s and 50s from primary sources and also the people I've been talking about. It still feels like it was um, quite disjointed. So I'm not sure if the museums are actually doing a service right now. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Please yes. 